Thank you very much. I'm sure that you are applauding because you'd like to hear George Beverly Shea sing again. <laughs> He'll be here tomorrow night, Saturday night, and Sunday night. I hope all of you will be back. But I'm overwhelmed by this introduction that President Bush has given me. I feel a little bit like I felt on a day in Philadelphia many years ago. I was to address the Presbyterian General Assembly, and I was coming down an elevator. And a man on the elevator looked me over, and he said, are you Billy Graham? And a friend next to me said, yes, that's Billy Graham. He looked me over another few seconds, and he said, my, what an anti-climax. and I'll be an anti-climax to all that President Bush has said. But I had another climax this evening when I talked to his wife, Barbara, on the phone. I tried to tell her what a good-looking husband she had and how wonderful he is to come here tonight and be with us on this opening night in the Metroplex. And uh, Mr. President, my wife and I love you and your family. We've had a lot of wonderful times together. I won't tell you how fast he runs his boat. <laughs> but he can run that boat as fast as it can get it to go between lobster traps in Maine. And we would hold on for dear life. <laughs> Thank you for slowing down, Mr. President. But we love the whole Bush family. That includes all the family. And we just have a great... I remember the first crusade we held in Texas was in Fort Worth in 1951. In Will Rogers Coliseum, and we were there for several weeks. Then we came over to Dallas, and a year or two later, in the Cotton Bowl. And I remember that last night, that place was jammed. We didn't have all the electronics we have today. I didn't have all the people to come and help in those days, just one or two. But Cliff Barras and George Beverly Shea were with me in all of those times, or I was with him. Now tonight, I want to turn to the most familiar passage in all the Bible for my text, John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. I know that there are, I know that there are many people here tonight from different religious backgrounds. I know that there are a lot of Roman Catholic people here tonight, and I really appreciate the cooperation of the Catholic Church here. I heard about a man from Texas. He went to New York, and uh, being a Baptist, he wasn't supposed to gamble. But he went to a horse race because he loved horses, and he saw a priest blessing a horse. So he bet on that horse. He said, this is not gambling. It's a sure thing if a priest blesses it. And that happened three times, so he put in even more money. And the, each horse won. So he won quite a bit of money. He said, I'm going to give it to the church, the Baptist church. <laughs> and then the fourth horse, the priest blessed. And he put even more money down. And that horse took off and ran halfway around. He was leading. And he fell dead, foaming at the mouth. So he went to see the priest and he said, Father, what happened? I saw you bless three horses and they won their races and the fourth horse died. What happened? The father said, you must not be a Catholic. He said, no, I'm a Baptist. He said, well, if you'd have been a Catholic, you'd have known the difference between a blessing and the last rites. So it's good for us to know each other and to get acquainted with each other, know each other on a personal basis. And tonight, 
There are people here from many different faiths, and we welcome all of you. Now tonight, I don't have to say, you already know, that our world is in turmoil. The wars between the Israelis and the Palestinians, the Iraq situation, the terrible bombing in Bali, in Indonesia, the snipers around Washington. Man's heart is the same as it ever was. But God so loved the world. And he's the one that has the answer. And there's no answer to our problem except Almighty God. And I'll get to it in a moment. He's going to intervene. That says, for God so loved the world, God cannot be proven scientifically. You can't put God in a test tube. You can't see him on a computer screen. But that doesn't mean he does not exist. I read about the discovery of a baby galaxy, which is over 13 billion light years from your Earth. Light from the object traveled for over 13 billion years before reaching our telescopes. And one light year is more than five trillion miles. Can you, you can't imagine. It's beyond comprehension as to what this universe is. And the Bible teaches that God created all of it. And I believe that. In Genesis 1-1, it says, in the beginning, God created heaven and the earth. In Psalm 33, it says, by the word of the Lord were the heavens made and all the host of them by the breath of his mouth. Think of it. God spoke all of that into existence. He said, my goodness, I can't believe that. I can't even. Unless I believe it, God is who he claims to be. You see, the Bible says that God is a spirit. And they that worship him must worship him in spirit and truth. God is unchanging. The scripture says, I am the Lord, I change not. In him is no variable, is neither shadow of turning, the scripture says. In all these centuries and eons of time, God has not changed even the slightest. It's hard for us to reconcile that. We think that God changes to please us or to help us or to hurt us. No, he's never changed. The Bible says that God is holy. He's holy in all his works, the psalmist said. Holy means there is not the slightest bit of sin in God. He can't even look upon sin, the Bible says. Thou art of purer eyes than to behold evil, Habakkuk says, and cannot look upon iniquity. God is absolute pure. He is the one pure substance in the universe. But the Bible also teaches that God is a God of judgment. The Bible says it's appointed unto men once to die and after that the judgment. The Bible says that God shall bring every work into judgment with every secret thing, whether it be good or whether it be evil. Someday, those of you who have never received Christ, never been born again, will stand before the mighty judgment of God called the white throne judgment. And we'll have to give an account even of the idle words and even of our thoughts and our intents, all the things we ever did will be there. There's a screen up there that I can see myself on right now. Someday there'll be a screen and everything that you ever did from the time you were born till the time you died will be there. And all the thoughts that you had that you thought nobody knew about will be there. And all of your intents will be there. Not just the things you did, but the things you thought. That's frightening. The Bible says the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. We fear him as we would fear our father. God is a loving father. I feared my father. I loved him with all my heart, but I surely was afraid of him when he picked up that switch and chasing me from time to time. The Bible says that every idle word that men shall speak they will give an account in the day of judgment. The Bible says he hath appointed a day, a day in which he will judge the world. It's already been appointed. A day has been selected already for that judgment and you'll be there. But the Bible also teaches that God is a God of love. 
The Bible says in 1 John 4, 8, God is love. And if you don't remember anything I say during these days here in this stadium, don't ever forget that God loves you. And God loves you. And God loves you. Whoever you are, whatever you are, whatever you've done, God loves you. Yea, I've loved thee with everlasting love. Jeremiah said. There's a popular song a few years ago. I can't live in a world without love. You don't have to. Because God loves you. If you think everybody else has forgotten you, or looking down on you for some reason, or misjudging you for some reason, and you think you're friendless and nobody loves you, God loves you. And that's why God created man in the beginning. God wanted some other creatures that he could have fellowship with and that he could love and they'd love him. So he made the Garden of Eden, fortunately or unfortunately, whichever way you look at it, the Garden of Eden was located in Iraq. Many of the biblical scenes in the Bible are from Iraq because Babylon was in Iraq. And some of the greatest judgments of God were upon Iraq in those days when they sinned against God. But we know when we look at our world today that something is wrong with human nature. What is wrong with that sniper around Washington that has so many people in fear? Something in his heart is wrong. And that something is called in the Bible sin. Terrorism, greed, immorality, racial prejudice, poverty. All these things are wrong because man is wrong. Man needs to be set right and only God can do it. And he loves you. People used to look on technology to save us. Now we're afraid that technology will destroy us. When we look and see all the things that are happening in the world on the screens. You know, C.S. Lewis, the great Cambridge professor, once said, war does not increase death. And I stopped and thought about that. War does not increase death. I had lunch with him one day in Cambridge. I was holding a series of meetings for the, at the university. And I asked him about that. And he explained it to me, that everyone is going to die. If you don't die in a war, you'll die of something else. It's appointed unto man once to die. Every person in this place is going to die, and we never know when. I'm sure that those people in New York, they had their usual coffee and toast, read the morning newspaper before heading to work at the Twin Towers or the Pentagon or boarding one of those four, era li or four planes. People never for a moment thought that they would not be coming home that night. Those people had great dreams for their lives, their careers, their marriages, their children. On the morning of September 11, I doubt that they entertained a thought that they wouldn't live to see those dreams fulfilled. And just a few days ago in Bali, in Indonesia, the people were out for an evening to celebrate. Well, they were on a vacation and had gone out for the evening expecting to have a good time. Never dreamed that they would die that very night. How many people go out on the highways today never dreaming that that will be their last day because of a motor car wreck? And the Bible says that God created man because he loved him. But man rebelled against God. Adam and Eve listened to the devil in the form of a serpent. And he tried to get them to doubt God's word. He said, yea, hath God said? And the devil is still using that same trick today, getting people to doubt the word of God. I believe that this Bible is inspired of God from one end to the other. And I believe the Bible teaches that. And there's a penalty to sin. Death. There's physical death when your body goes to the grave. There's spiritual death when your soul is lost 
What shall it profit a man if he gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Our soul or our spirit lives forever, either in heaven or in hell. And the choices you make here will decide where. God, being a God of love, decided to do something about it. He decided to send his son, Jesus Christ, to this earth to walk among us, to live among us, to be born among us. And the scripture says he gave his only begotten son. That word begotten means unique, his own unique son. I've never quite understood God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, all equal, all God. I heard a great scholar the other day trying to explain it, but he never explained it to my satisfaction. God had a son, and he sent him to rescue us, to save us. He took the initiative in giving Christ, and he took our sins on the cross. And when you look at the cross, you see Jesus. The Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. But he further says, for he hath made him to be sin for us. Can you imagine Jesus being guilty of all your sins and all of mine and all the sins of the whole world? Guilty of immorality, guilty of murder, guilty of kidnapping, rape, whatever it is. He was guilty. God laid on him all our sins. And the Romans took him outside of Jerusalem and nailed him to a cross nails in each hand, pulled his beard, put a crown of thorns on him, put a spear in his side, he bled, but then he made a statement, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Then he made another statement, he bowed his head and said it's finished. What did he mean? He meant that the way of salvation is complete. You can not add anything to it. You can work good all your life and put all your money in some good cause, but that's not the way to salvation. That's a result of salvation. That's a result of your faith. But in order for you to really have Christ in your heart and to know that you're going to heaven, you must receive him as your savior. But after his death, he rose again. And Jesus, Jesus is not dead on a cross. Jesus is alive forevermore. He said, I'm the resurrection and the life. He that believeth on me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whoso liveth and believeth in me shall never die. And the scripture says, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in thine heart that God has raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. But that's not the end of it. God is going to intervene again in history, in the future. Hereafter, Jesus said, shall ye see the Son of Man sitting on the right hand of power. Right now, Jesus on the right side of God. You know what he does there? He pleads to God the Father for you. Right now, he's asking the Father to forgive you of your sins because he took the sins on the cross and he completed the work of salvation. Hereafter shall ye see the Son of Man sitting on the right hand of power and coming in the clouds of heaven. He's going to come back and he's going to be the one that ultimately settles the problems of the world. When will he come? We don't know. Jesus said, don't speculate. It may be tomorrow. It may be a thousand years from now. But someday he's coming back. And the Jewish people look for Messiah to come. We look for Jesus to come, whom we believe is the Messiah. But we all are looking for the coming of Messiah. Well, what should we do in the meantime?
to be sure that we're going to heaven, to be sure that our sins are forgiven, to change our way of life here on earth. In his first sermon that Jesus preached, he said, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Repentance means to be sorry enough to quit. It means that you're going in one direction in your life and you turn around and go the other direction. But you don't have the power to do that. You can't give up the things that are wrong in your life. That's why you need the Holy Spirit to help you, to change, to turn loose of those things that you know are wrong. God commands all men everywhere to repent. It means to go in the opposite direction. And secondly, you must have faith. And that word faith means commitment. Without faith, it is impossible to please him. And that he, he cometh to God must believe that he is. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. If you believe, if you commit, he'll receive you. For by grace are ye saved. That word grace means unmerited favor. You don't deserve it. You can't do anything to earn it. You come by faith in Jesus Christ. The Bible says that faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. In this computer age in which we live, I thought a cartoon in the paper put it very well the other day. Someone wrote to the pastor and said, Dear preacher, what does God forgives you mean? Signed, confused. The preacher wrote back, It means all your files are deleted. How wonderful to go home tonight knowing that it's all over. It's forgiven.